I'd now like to introduce the final segment of this morning's program, our panel of experts. We are going to do a deep dive into the changing nature of the workforce and the role employers can play. Please join me in welcoming on stage Lee Brandstetter, Professor of Economics and Public Policy and Director of the Center for the Future of Work at Carnegie Mellon University, Michelle Chang, Director of the Markle Foundation Rework America's Business Network, a national initiative to transform the labor market so that all Americans can thrive in the digital economy, and Johnny C. Taylor, Jr., President and CEO of Society for Human Resource Management, the largest HR professional society, SHRM has 300,000 members in over 165 countries who have impacted the lives of 115 million workers every single day. We also have Adam Siegel, founder and CEO of Cove. Headquartered in DC, Cove provides workspace solutions to its members in the DMV in Boston. Moderating today's panel discussion is Sylvan Lane, the Hills Finance Reporter. Sylvan, over to you. Thanks so much, and thank you everybody for coming out today. Uh, we've had a great event so far, and I'm looking forward to ending it on a really exciting note. Uh, and to the four of you, thanks so much for joining us as well. All four of you have you know, a lot of your own unique experiences, uh, thinking about the future of work, studying it, analyzing it, thinking about what's going to come next. So to just kind of start off with you know, a table setter question, what are the biggest changes and the trends you're seeing in the way that the future of work is being shaped in this country? Adam, if you want to start us off, and then we could go down the row. Sure. Great. Thanks for having me, Sylvan. Um, yeah, I think what we see in general is, especially we're going to be talking about a little bit about artificial intelligence and kind of this gap between uh, technology-based or highly skilled workers versus the opposite of the spectrum. I think the big thing we see is, and we were talking about it earlier, is being a creative thinker. So you can be able to adapt to and be retrained and reskilled irrespective of what job you're going to be doing. It's not the same anymore where you go and work for a single company for 40 years or even 15 years, we're becoming more and more like free agents. So we just need to have that skill base and be able to adapt and really retool ourselves in a creative way so that you can apply it in a lot of different ways. So I'd say it's managing a multi-generational workforce. This is the first time, literally, in American history where we've had five uh, you know, generations in the workplace at the same time. And so on one hand, you have this amazing diversity, but it comes with some equally amazing challenges, managing that, figuring out what matters to the older worker that may not matter to the Generation Z person. And so we're seeing this manifest itself in the workplace as older workers stay, as individuals stay in the workplace longer, for example. That creates real problems for those of us who are in middle management waiting to become take that C-suite spot. Because if your boss is 55, and announces to you, I'm not retiring until I'm 75. That means you're in trouble. I mean, you know, guess what? You leave because you want promotional opportunities. It has created some real angst. We, we are excited about the diversity in the workplace, multi-generational workplace, but it has really created some serious tension. Yeah, and I think for us, when we hear about the future of work, people think about self-driving cars taking away taxi drivers' jobs. But what we're actually hearing is that it's not about just a select group of occupations that's going to be impacted, the vast majority of jobs are going to change with the way workers are interacting with technology and the way that they're going to need digital skills. So think about the roadside assistance worker. This happened to me the other day. Had a flat tire. He did his job. After that, he busted out an iPad. He took pictures to show that he actually completed the job, then had me sign paperwork on that iPad. Or think about your child care worker. They're documenting your child's naps and diaper changes on a device, not on pen and paper anymore. So we've got to make sure that people have the digital skills to actually be able to succeed. And so we've got to really make sure that we are focusing on what the foundational skills are needed. One HR executive put it this way, there's not going to be a job in the future that somebody is not going to interact with some kind of device, need to look at the data on that device and make some kind of decision based on that. So we've got to make sure people have those digital literacy skills the data analysis skills, the decision-making skills. And I think above all, like Adam said, we need a growth mindset, that ability to change and adapt and be flexible to the changing environment. And Lee? Yeah, I agree with all this. Um, I mean, in a way, what's going on in the labor force right now is part of a longer-term trend. We've been deploying information technology in the U.S. workforce now for a generation. Right. We know it's had an impact. We know it's strengthened demand for the most skilled workers in our economy and weakened demand for the less skilled. And now a lot of us think that this is about to move to a new level. But when we get beyond that generality, the government and all of us are to some extent flying blind. We don't really have a good measure 
of the deployment of AI and related technologies in the economy. There's no government statistic that tracks this. So how do we design policy around this? And how do we, as managers right, and consultants, prepare business leaders to contend with this when we're not measuring it? Right? We need better and more data. I think this is really important. Right, and I'm glad you brought that up, Lee, because obviously one of the major forces behind the ways that the workforce is changing, and all of you have brought this up in unique different ways, is the fact that so much of it's becoming dependent on information technology, mm -hmm. AI. And uh, Lee, to come back to you for a second, what, you know, who's AI, as AI is becoming a greater part of the workforce, who's this helping? Who's this hurting? You said it's tough to track right now, but based on what you've been able to do through your own research and what you've been able to gain from studying this, what kind of impact are we seeing right now in terms of who it's most beneficial to? Well, again, it's really hard to say, right? Because AI is this general purpose technology. Eventually, it's probably going to be deployed in every sector. Um, it's going to impact everything that we do. But we're trying to shine a light on this at Carnegie Mellon by using AI to track AI. If I could just say a quick word on how we're doing this. Right, so uh, when somebody comes up with a cool new AI invention, they have an incentive to patent it, or at least part of it, because if they don't, somebody else might. So lots of AI inventions or parts of AI inventions are getting patented. We're training machine language algorithms to parse the text in patent documents, figure out whether a patent is AI related or not. Once we can tag it, we know the firm that created it. We know the industry in which it's being deployed. We know where the inventors were that created it. We can start to map this out in space and industry space and time, and we can link AI invention to all the other data the U.S. government captures on U.S. enterprises, including demand for specific types of workers. So I don't have a definitive answer for you yet, but hopefully I will in a few months. I mean, at the moment, I think what we can say is that this looks like the IT revolution that we've already seen, <clears throat> only more so, right? Great news for the most skilled, not so great news for the least skilled. You know, it's interesting. While the, the same token, we sometimes overplay the, um, not you, but the idea of <laughs> skilled versus unskilled. Fact of the matter is the 7.5 million jobs that we have open in America right now, many of them go unfilled because we are so busy looking for skilled workers, people with technology backgrounds, et cetera. We need welders. We need carpenters. These are skills, but we don't think of them that way. Those are low-skilled jobs. Well, hell, you know, I don't know if you've ever tried to weld something. You need a, a pretty good, damn good skill or you burn buildings down. Right, So there's, in fact, a skill that you need there. So I think we've got to begin to think in terms of language, how we refer to. There are jobs that don't require college degrees, not even remotely, but are highly skilled. Uh, and so I want, we should be really conscious about that. And those are many of the jobs that are going unfilled right now. We at the Society for Human Resource Management know our HR managers are saying, please find me, carpenters, welders. We're talking about bringing manufacturing jobs back. Guess what? Someone has to do them. Just to tackle it, it's a really good point. When you think about this notion of highly skilled in a very similar way, for all of the talk of software engineer in these, there's less than 2 million software engineers <laughs> right. in the United States, right? right? There's 331 million people in the US, and we're talking about 1.6 million people. That's not going to be, that's not the base of the economy, right? right? That is the, the, the top end of the utmost small infantile relative to the broader, the broader economy as a whole. So when you think about skilled, what does skilled mean? Maybe we're changing our definition of that's what skilled right. means in the broader workforce and also thinking about, and I think one thing which actually uh, very similar and I think is very much in line with what you're saying is this notion of not necessarily skilled, but also just proficient. Right. We have a real lack of proficiency in the US. Uh, the average eighth grader is 36% proficient in English and math, right? That, that's the bigger, forget the highly skilled component. Let's just be <laughs> able to read and write. That's <laughs> really what we're talking about here. And then if once you can solve for that, they can do anything, yeah. right? We can put them in any place not necessarily going to be a software developer that's you know, writing the latest algorithm for AI, which is coming and is here. It's just part of society. But how do we play into that? And who, how do we play off of that so that the workforce is proficient to be able to solve for what the jobs of the future are? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what do you make of, you know, Adam just talked about you know, the ver variety of different skills and the different you know, levels and thresholds of expertise that you need. And you mentioned before that there's going to be every single job at some point, regardless of what it is, where you're going to be interacting with some sort of device, what are some things that employers and businesses could be doing to help get the candidates for these jobs closer to that level that they can perform the duties that they're looking for? So at the Markle Foundation, we're very focused on skills. Because right now, we believe that the system is not working for everyone. So employers are saying they can't find the talent they need 
Educators are saying they don't know what skills to train students for, and workers are struggling to art clearly articulate what they can do to employers. So we've got to make skills be something that is not only valued, but also recognized, regardless of where you acquire those skills. We really need to make skills be the great equalizer. Because right now, employers are using degrees, education, experience as proxies of what someone can do, because they have no other way to figure it out. There's no common language. So, and that in itself is filtering out the 70% of American adults who don't have a four-year degree. So if we can build a system that's around skills, we can at least make sure everyone has a level playing field to compete. Gotcha. Now, shifting gears a little bit to something that's you know in line with the broader issue of a great chunk of the American workforce not being prepared to take on the jobs of the future is the fact that a lot of the jobs that we're seeing created right now and a lot of the broader economic trends that we're seeing a lot of the, depend, the, the retirement benefits that people could depend on, pensions, that's starting to slip away a little bit. Wages have not increased at the same rate as they have in previous generations. The economy is still recovering in a lot of ways from the recession, and there's still a pretty major gap in inequality. And I wanted to get your perspectives on how the, ways the, how the different ways the workforce is changing. How is that impacting workers who are still struggling to you know, get their footing and not only save for now, but save for the future? and build up enough of the you know, savings and benefits that they need to be able to survive. Johnny, do you want to start us off there? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the fact of the matter is we know that there was a significant portion of the population that was left behind as a result of what happened in 2008. And frankly, it's not just the people who were displaced at the time. It was, frankly, younger people who had just graduated college. They'd incurred six figures of student loan debt to become X, and that job didn't manifest. So they had to go back home, figure out how to service that debt, and because we made you know, Uncle Sam responsible for all of that debt, you can't even write it off in bankruptcy right now. So they are really struggling under this amazing amount of debt, and by the way, they were prepared for jobs that frankly don't exist anymore. We forget, 2008 was the debacle. This is 2019, a decade later. If it's true that jobs go away every 10 years or so, the jobs they were prepared to do that they spent six figures to, in debt to, to acquire don't even exist anymore. I have friends who went to law school coming out with $200,000 in debt. And frankly, that's an area where AI and technology has totally transformed. When I began my practice, there was a law library. There isn't anymore. And so all of those people went to go be law librarians. Good luck. Um, and there was no legal Zoom. My God, half the people can do it themselves, right? That wasn't a commercial for legal Zoom, by the way. Um, <laughs> but the idea is we are all struggling no matter this idea that it's just the poor or just the older worker. The fact of the matter is everyone, every generation is struggling with this monumental change that occurred economically as well as the technological advances. So, so if I get something about that, I mean, I think, you know, Johnny's pointed to something very important, right, which is that the specific skills required by specific jobs are going to be hard to forecast mm -hmm. because everything is so dynamic and changing so quickly, right? But a lot of those jobs are going to rest on a foundation that is very clear. Right? I mean, math is a very important foundation, a gateway to the remunerative careers of the 21st century, where we're whether we're talking about, about skilled blue-collar jobs or even the most skilled white-collar jobs. And we do a pretty crappy job of preparing Americans for this math-driven future, and that's especially true mm -hmm. for members of our historically disadvantaged communities. So what can we do better? Well, we've got new technology now. This is a place where AI might actually help reduce inequality. Because the learning science that we developed over the last generation tells us that different people learn in different ways, but it's very hard to personalize education in a conventional classroom. But now we have at least the possibility of AI-driven adaptive learning systems that can respond to the needs, the challenges of individual students. Right? So we still need human teachers in classrooms to coach and provide inspiration and encouragement and accountability. But we can now get much closer to this dream that learning scientists have had for a generation of personalized education for every student at a politically acceptable price. And if we could get there, the results would be game changing. A generation ago, Ben Bloom, learning science pioneer, basically proved this, right? When you give people individualized instruction, you can improve learning outcomes by two standard deviations. Imagine if we could double or triple the amount of science and math that the average American <clears throat> student learns in the K through 12 grades. That would be a game changer. I think we could get there in a couple of decades. 
Now, I've got a load more questions for you guys. I, I could spend all day talking about this, but I do want to open it up to the audience and see if there's anybody who has any questions uh, for our panel. Hi, this is for the broader panel. Um, I, Lee, I heard you uh, say that there was not enough information on AI. However, um, and th again, this is to the broader panel, every single time I look at a either report or article talking about algorithmic bias, it's even worse than the previous report that I read a year before. Um, can the panel talk about kind of the impact on algorithmic bias is going to have on the future of work and kind of like the impact of garbage in, garbage out? Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe I can start. So this is something that, that we at Carnegie Mellon are taking very seriously and trying to understand uh, much better. Um, and a number of my colleagues are actually exploring this, trying to document it. I mean, the good news uh, is that these algorithms are things that we create, right? They currently reflect the biases that exist in our larger society. But at least in principle, we could engineer into these algorithms checks and balances against these biases, right? Now, we're not there yet, right? But, uh, I mean, at least the promise exists that we can move from systematic algorithmic bias to algorithms that actually check our bias and question the bias. And that's where we're trying to go. But you're absolutely right to flag this and as an important issue, right? Because as you, as you said, garbage in, garbage out. We create these things. They reflect us, both the good and the bad and the unjust. And to, to further, especially in the employment context. So this has become a real issue when you look at recruitment. Um, now, admittedly, the way that we currently recruit is pretty bad. It is full of bias, is subject to all sort of bias. If I don't like women, I see this, but certain names don't trigger, trigger different feelings. All of my conscious and some unconscious biases apply. But what we're, to your point, it's better the AI is at least better than it was, because taking that specific human bias out, which oftentimes a human is not even aware of that bias, and so it plays into things that, things that are just deep-seated issues, right? And so what we found is the AI has at least gotten us to a better place than we were. And to your point, working with uh, folks who are really smart at this at Carnegie Mellon and people like my colleague here, they can help us address the bias that will naturally come from a system that is based upon human beings. Just a quick, in a, in a very consumer-centric way to think about it, not to throw another brand, but the iPhone, iPhone 1 versus, you know, iPhone, I don't even know what they're on, <laughs> but it's incredibly advanced, right? Technology is just going it, it, to, so, it innovates so much faster with time. That's the beauty of it. And so while there may be, you know, certain components, as you say, garbage in, at the out in, you know, six months, it's going to be far better than it is now. And so that's just going to evolve. And as Johnny suggested, it's, it's even better than humans right now. Great. Uh, anyone else have a question? Hi, uh, I'm with Source America, and we're doing work on uh, the future of work and persons with disabilities in the United States. Um, so in some of the presentations today, we've heard two different reflections on the current state of the economy. There is the low unemployment rate, but then there was also a reflection on the labor force participation rate and the number of people that are out of the labor market. I was just wondering from the panelists, um, when you think about the nearly 14 million people with disabilities in a working age that are out of the labor force, what do you see in terms of the future of work and including them in this conversation? Do you mind if I, no, I think it's a great question. And I think the future of work is part of, part of the benefit of where we're going is this notion of being more and more distributed. And it's going to play so well into people especially of all types, but specifically disabilities. I can't leave the home. So now that you can work more and more and be in home, as people are now becoming more and more distributed, they're not necessarily going to an office every day, which would prohibit some people from being in the labor force. Now that everyone's able to work more and more distributedly, it's going to open up a whole ton of opportunity, not only, for, not only for people with disabilities, but the ability to work in your community, not necessarily have to commute to a downtown office. The thought of an office in 10 years will be you know, beyond concept. My daughter, who's two, will say, wait, you're telling me 10 years ago people used to go to an office every day. They would commute. They'd spend an hour commuting on a metro or, or get in a car and, and drive an hour. No, that's like technology is enabling us to work from wherever. It's going to open up opportunities for everyone, especially those with disabilities that have difficulties getting to a place of work. 
I, was, go ahead. Sure. I was just going to add too. I think it is also incumbent on employers to think about how they hire. So, for example, our team was out at Microsoft last week, and they are really thinking about how do they bring in different talent pools in. For example, they have a program targeted at autistic people. They took their entire existing hiring process and adjusted it to make sure that they were mindful of how these people could best perform in the interview environment. So instead of doing a one day back to back five different interviews, they brought them in for an entire week. They let them have big breaks in between. And then once they were hired, they did significant training with the teams that they were gonna be a part of to make sure that they were aware of how they would best learn and how they could best thrive. So I think it is incumbent on the employers to think about if they wanna really bring in the best talent, you've gotta widen the talent pool and also adjust your hiring processes to not filter those people out. And I was going to, yeah, absolutely, it is incumbent upon us because ultimately we're responsible for finding the human beings who will fuel a company's growth. And so this really is something that we in the HR function, uh, HR profession are focused on, I mean, almost uh, maniacally right now, figuring out how to get into these untapped pools. If they include the disabled or they include people of, uh, you know, as we under under uh, represented minorities, uh, people who are formerly incarcerated. For example, the fact of the matter is we've got 7.5 million open jobs, 6 million people looking for those jobs, and HR people are ultimately responsible for bringing and solving for that deficit, that talent deficit. So I'm pleased to say, notwithstanding what the arguments are around how we count and account for unemployment, this is the lowest unemployment rate of people with disabilities from the Department of Labor in our history, as we have yeah. been keeping numbers. So it is a very deliberate and intentional effort to ensure that all Americans get a shot at these jobs, because we need them. And with that, that's unfortunately all the time we have. I want to thank the panel so much for coming out today and sharing their insight with us. I want to thank all of you for coming out as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.